I'm going to be talking to you about uh, my experiences with leopards. I was extremely lucky to uh, start working down in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, and I ended up with my bum in the butt in many ways in the midst of this amazing first opportunity to view leopard behavior directly, which was something that was not possible until we started observing these particular leopards. So I just thought I'd tell you a little bit of, uh, give you a little bit of background about the, the leopard work that we did, and then go on to talk to you about citizen science, which is effectively what this leopard project was, because I'm not a scientist. I'm just a keen naturalist, like many, many people all around the world. Uh, and yet I was able to make some contribution to our knowledge of leopard behavior and unlock lep uh, uh, leopard behavior for the rest uh, of, of, of the world. Um, and then I'm going to show you a lot of photographs and then also tell you a couple of stories about uh, some of the leopard experiences that I've had over the years. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is the... Um, the, a little bit of background as to how it all came about, uh, because I think it's, it's, it's quite, quite important to understand that background. You know, we started uh, at uh, working in the Sabi Sand. I started working in the Sabi Sand in the 1970s, in 1976 to be exact. And um, in those days, we had these old beaten up Land Rovers. We had a very low budget. Our guests stayed in these four rondavals, a long drop toilet that they shared and a shower in a tree, a bucket shower in a tree. And we went out on game drives on these old Land Rovers looking for wildlife. The bush was extremely thick in those days, so it was quite hard to spot animals. So one of the most important aspects of our wildlife viewing was the guy on the right hand side of this picture. And that is a, a, a guy from the local ethnic group, the Shangan tribal group. And they were traditionally hunters and incredibly good tracking. They had incredibly good tracking skills. And many of them today still have incredibly good tracking skills. And so we used the trackers to help us find the wildlife. And this was a very, very important aspect regarding the leopard viewing that we eventually, uh, eventually had. Um, the tracker would sit on the front of the vehicle, scan the road ahead, looking for, for tracks. In particular, we were looking for lion tracks. Uh, and then when we found the tracks, we would follow the tracks into the bush until we found the lions. And then we would come back to the vehicle and then uh, take the, the, the guests in the vehicle to go and view the lions. And that's how we operated on a daily basis, uh, looking for wildlife. Um, we saw a lot of wildlife, lions and elephants and uh, rhinos, buffalo, as well as all the general game. But one of the animals that eluded us was leopards. Um, we didn't know, however, that there were leopards there. There, were, there was lots of sign of leopard. We would hear them calling at night from our, our wonderful little wilderness camp. Uh, we would come, at, come out in the mornings and, and find their tracks in various parts of the, of the reserve. Uh, and then we would quite often find kills hanging up in trees. And when we found a fresh kill, we would park our vehicle nearby and then sit quietly and wait and hope that a leopard would come and feed on the kill. And we would wait an hour or two. And in fact, I don't even remember once having any success from those waiting periods. We would go away, come back an hour later to find that the kill had been fed on or had been moved. We'd sit patiently and wait, and once again, no sign of the leopard. And that was very typical of leopard behavior. They really avoided human activity. Any kind of human activity, the leopards avoided. Uh, and so they were extremely hard to see. We, we did occasionally get glimpses of them, particularly at night running across a road, but that was pretty much it. Now, the the book that we used to gather information about the wildlife all around us. There, was, uh, there were very few publications at that time, but there was one particular book that we found incredibly useful. It was a book called Portraits in the Wild, which was 
uh, written by a biologist by the name of Cynthia Moss. Uh, and in it, she summarized all the available information of all of Africa's big game animals. Uh, and we use this to uh, learn about the behavior of, of the wildlife in the area and, um, and pass that information on to our guests. But one of the things that stood out was the section on leopards. Uh, and these are two quotes that clearly indicate the lack of knowledge of leopard behavior uh, at that time. There was a, a lot of information on lions. So uh, in 1966, the Serengeti Lion Project was started by um, Scheller, and that produced a lot of information. Uh, in 1972, Hans Crook did some amazing work on spotted hyena in the Ngorongoro crater. So there was some great information on a lot of wildlife, but very little information on leopards. And this was because of their very shy nature. So any biologist that tried to study leopards had to use indirect methods of study, like uh, radio telemetry, and uh, collecting feces and analyzing feces and getting some idea of what the leopards were eating. So there was a bit of information about leopard movement and about uh, what leopards were, were, were eating. But other than that, very little information on the actual behavior of leopards. Um, but in 1979, all of this changed for us. And what, what happened is one night, one of the game drives was driving down, a, a guy with his tracker and a group, small group of guests was driving down a riverbed uh, in the middle of the area that we traversed. And the tracker spotted a pair of little leopard cups sitting in a tree on the bank of the river. Uh, and almost immediately, these two little leopard cubs clambered down out of the tree and went into a little hole in the sandbank and uh, disappeared but they did get a little glimpse of these leopard cubs. So first thing in the morning, the guide and tracker went back to the same spot and got another glimpse of these little leopard cubs. Uh, and this went on for about two or three days each day, twice a day, the, uh, one or two of the game drive vehicles would go to the den and sit patiently and get more and more little glimpses of these uh, little leopard cubs until about the third day, um, when we arrived at the den site, we found these leopard tracks all over the place. It was a track of a female leopard with her two little cubs, and they were moving along the riverbed. There were tracks of this family of leopards moving along the riverbed. And for the very first time, the trackers decided that they would try and track leopards. Up until that time, they avoided tracking leopards. They knew it was not possible to find leopards. But on this particular occasion, we decided, let's see if we could track these leopards down. And we followed the tracks, followed the tracks until eventually we found the next den site. And that led to some more viewing of the little leopard cubs. And as time went by, these little leopard cubs got more and more accustomed to the presence of our vehicles. And that was largely due to the sensitive way that the guides approached the den site, trying to keep their distance so that the cubs got more and more accustomed to, to the presence of the vehicles. And then gradually, after a period of months, we started getting more and more sightings of the female leopard. She was incredibly shy in the beginning, but towards uh, after about six months, we started getting fairly regular sightings of the female leopard. And um, by uh, uh, 10, 12 months, by the time the cubs were about 10 or 12 months old, uh, the female leopard was now also quite accustomed uh, to the presence of the vehicles. So this was actually an amazing opportunity to start recording leopard behavior. And uh, I'd just been spending a bit of time down in the subantarctic uh, working together with scientists. So I got some understanding of, of the collection of data. And so I began to collect um, uh, as much information as I could about the leopards. And I recorded all this information in numerous notebooks that I carried with me everywhere I went, and uh, every leopard sighting was carefully recorded. And uh, gradually, as time went by, we started to build up some information about the leopard behavior. And we assumed at that point that once the, this leopard had raised those cubs and we no longer had the advantage of the den anchoring her in, in that area, that we would lose sight of her and then perhaps the whole thing would come to an end. 
But we carried on recording the leopard information and we carried on until eventually, after a period of 12 years, that particular female leopard had produced nine litters of cubs. She raised 16 of the cubs from those litters. And many of those cubs had produced cubs of their own. So now for the first time, there was actually a, a whole little population of leopards that were habituated to the presence of vehicles. And so we were able to start building up an incredible database of information about leopard behavior. We truly, uh, you know, the title of your talks here is Unlocking Nature. In this case, we unlocked the behavior of leopards. So it was a fantastic opportunity to build up data. And we got to learn a lot about leopard behavior. So where it all started, was the uh, den sites and the mother-cub relations. Uh, what we found quite early on was that the female leopard would, would move her cubs from one den to another on a fairly regular basis. She didn't keep the cubs permanently in one particular den site. Uh, when the cubs were really small, she would carry them one by one. If she had a litter of three, she would go one by one carrying the cubs from one den site to the next, sometimes as far as a couple of kilometers away. Uh, and then when the cubs got a little bit older, the cubs would walk with the mother to the new den site. And in the meantime, between raising the cubs, she would also be out going off hunting and looking after herself, feeding herself. She would make kills and then go back to the cubs, nurse the cubs, go back to her kills. So she would commute between her kills and her cubs until, when, until the cubs reached about two months of age. And then from then onwards, she would start bringing the cubs to her kill. So the cubs we found were starting to feed on meat uh, from the third month onwards. Uh, we learned a lot about their hunting be behavior. We were able to um, uh, follow them as they went hunting. If we kept our distance and limited the number of vehicles at a sighting like that, we were able to really get a good handle on how leopards uh, went about their hunting. And we found out that uh, they were ex extremely patient hunters, uh, using incredible patience, waiting for the right opportunity to stalk and get as close as they possibly can before pouncing. Uh, and usually spending in, uh, quite often hours following one particular herd of impala, for example, and remaining undetected and uh, until they eventually make a pounce. Uh, so a lot of observation, lying quietly, watching the impala, moving past them, trying to ascertain where they're going and then going around and setting an ambush so that they could pounce on their prey. Very adept at using cover, any particular cover they, they had, even if it was just grass, they were very good at hiding in the grass and, and using leopard crawl, crawl to get close to their prey animals. And then some fair, uh, so, something that isn't often seen, but this mongoose-like behavior where a leopard will try and look over the long grass to a small antelope in the grass. In, in this case, this leopard was uh, looking at a dacre that was moving towards, it, towards her, which she subsequently killed. Uh, and then they would kill their prey by by biting sometimes for small prey, they would bite on the back of the neck at the base of the skull and, and break, the, break the neck. Otherwise, they would suffocate the animal, squeezing the windpipe or by squeezing the, the, the nasal passages of the animal that they are killing. Uh, and then one of the things that we, we found is that quite a lot of leopards became specialists hunting particular prey animals. Um, warthogs was quite a common uh, speciality of, of many of the leopards. They would uh, learn that warthogs slept in burrows and then they would go and wait at the opening of burrows for the warthogs to return to the burrows in the evening and then pounce on them. Uh, and then one example of a wonderful specialist is this particular leopard that we observe on quite a regular basis up in the South Luangwa National Park. Uh, and what we do is we go and we look for her. Uh, eventually, we'll find her lying somewhere in the bush near the, the, the Luangwa River. We'll wait for her to start moving. And then she will occasionally move down to the river, maybe go and have a drink of water. And as the sun is starting to set, she'll climb up into a big grove of African ebony trees and then just 
uh, huddle down in the, the very highest branches of these ebony trees and then go to sleep. And then what you do is you just sit there and you wait and you wait and after a while, as the birds are starting to sing and call as the sun is setting, you eventually hear but amongst all the bird calling, you'll hear the little uh, calls of, of a group of guinea fowl as they come trotting through the woodland, straight through beneath the uh, grove of ebony trees uh, to the bank of the river and then fly from the river bank across the river in, onto the low sand bank down at the water's edge. And there the guinea fowl would roam around in circles and go and drink water and fluff their feathers and socialize. Uh, and then by this time it's getting almost completely dark until eventually as it's uh, nearly dark, the guinea fowls then fly one by one from the sand bank up into the high branches of the ebony trees. And uh, they get up into the branches and one by one until eventually suddenly one of them lands too close to the leopard and she just suddenly wakes up and grabs a, uh, a guinea fowl and uh, comes running down out of the tree with the guinea fowl in her mouth. Uh, and then straight down out of the tree and then she will settle down and pluck all the feathers out of the guinea fowl and feed on the guinea fowl. And once she's done that, she will then go off on her nightly hunt. And it's wonderful to go there to that grove of uh, uh, ebony trees in the morning to find these piles of guinea fowl feathers from uh, all the other kills that she's made on previous days and weeks previously. Uh, so that's what her speciality is and she'll always return to that area. And for some reason, the guinea fowls uh, never seem to learn. I, I suppose that's where the, the term bird brain comes from. One of the more interesting um, discoveries that we made is what happens to the leopard, leopard cubs once they become independent of the mother. Uh, and in order to do that, it's important to know every single individual leopard. So we developed a, an identification system for the leopards, which was based on the, the, the spot patterns of the individual leopards. And there's many spots that you can use to identify the leopard. What we ended up doing was we chose the spots around the whiskers here. So where the whiskers meet the face, there are these rows of spots, but immediately above the rows, there's a little group of spots here, which we use. So if you look at this male leopard here, an old male leopard from the Northern Sabi sand, you can see he has two big dots that have joined together, a medium sized dot, and then a little one and a tiny little one at the top. So he's got effectively three, uh, four blotches on the right hand side of his face. And if you look on his left hand side, he has five dots. So a tiny little one, a slightly bigger one, and then two bigger ones at the back with one very small one at the top. So he's got five on his right and four on his left. And that's what the system that we would use to identify every uh, individual leopard. So if you look at um, this particular leopard, a female up in the um, Lower Zambezi National Park in Zambia, you can see she has three dots on her left side and she has three dots on her right hand side. So again, uh, a slightly different pattern. Uh, and then if you look at this leopard, this leopard is fairly unique. Or, uh, 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 I don't think I have seen a leopard with a marking like this that has no spots at all above the whisker spots, completely devoid on both sides. Uh, usually there's one spot or two spots or three, they vary in number, but this particular female from Botswana had no spots at all. Uh, and then sometimes if you see leopards that you are not really 100% sure of, we then go to these blotches uh, above the eyes. And that's more than enough to help you identify the leopard. So what we did is we took photographs, portrait photographs of every single leopard that we saw. And, uh, and then we would I, I give each leopard a name and we would record the movements of all those particular leopards. And what did we find? We thought that maybe when all the leopards uh, became independent of their mothers, that each one of them would disperse far and wide and form their own territories. But we were kind of half right with that in that uh, female leopards did not do that. The male leopards did. Female leopards tended to stay around 
in the area uh, that they were born in. But male leopards disappeared. So, for example, this particular photograph is, uh, is, is a, a Google Earth map of the area in which we operated in. And that blue circle is the original mother leopard. Uh, and roughly that's the territory that she roamed around in with that dry riverbed as the central part of her territory. Uh, and then her daughter, one of her daughters, the Tuguan a, a leopard that we called the Tuguan female, eventually moved out, became independent of the mother and established her territory to the south of the mother's territory, right on the border overlapping the mother's territory. And another leopard uh, born in her, I think it was her fourth or fifth litter, was a female leopard that we called the Sand River female. She established her territory to the north of the mother's territory, overlapping the mother's territory. And male leopards, the male leopard cubs that we saw growing up in the area, once they became independent, we lost track of them. Within a year or so, they disappeared from our area. And then we started getting photographs of leopards, uh, male leopards that, that had, were born in the area way down to the south and even into the Kruger National Park. Uh, and so the males were dispersing, spreading the genes, but the males were sticking, the females were sticking around right on the borders of their mother's territory. So it's almost a little bit not unlike, in fact, lion prides. If you have a look at lion prides, which are social animals, lion prides are made up of related females. This is almost like an exploded pride of leopards, if you like, where the, the females have dispersed from one another, but still live in close proximity to one another. So that, to me, was one of the most interesting discoveries that we made. Um, I left that area in 1992, but the guides uh, and landowners in the Sabi Sand have kept track of all those individual leopards that we watched over that period of time, uh, right up to the present day. And this has now made it uh, certainly the longest continuous leopard study in the world. Uh, and uh, the guys in that area are observing sixth and seventh generation leopards from that original female leopard that we saw in the 70s. Uh, this project, um, it's been a brilliant example of citizen science because I was not and still am not a scientist, but we were able to gather this data just from ob observation and curiosity. And I'll get back to that a little bit later about uh, the citizen science. Um, what happened is that uh, this kind of habituation process started happening in other places in Africa as well. So uh, there's a, a well-known uh, group of leopards up in, in Kenya in the Maasai Mara uh, that were made famous by a photographer by the name of Jonathan Scott. They became very habituated. Um, the leopards of South Luangwa are, are also habituated very much that, that uh, guinea fowl specialist being a good example of that. And then I still think that one of the best leopard uh, viewing places in Africa is, is the Okavango Delta in Botswana, where there are some incredible um, habituated leopard uh, populations. Um, and one of those leopards was one that we viewed in the northern part of Botswana on the river called the Kwando River. And I just want to tell you this little story. Uh, which for me was one of uh, the most exciting uh, leopard experiences that I ever had. Uh, we were out on a morning game drive. It was a cold winter's morning, uh, middle of July in Botswana. We were all wrapped up like we are tonight in, in, the, in South Africa at the moment. Uh, and we were on this morning drive and we came across these fresh leopard tracks uh, moving along the road. We decided to follow them. We had a tracker, a local guide, myself, and I had two guests uh, from Canada with me, two very enthusiastic, passionate wildlife enthusiasts. And uh, we followed these leopard tracks. And they moved along the road, and eventually they turned off the road. And um, we then made a decision. We tried to decide, do we follow the tracks through the bush, or should we go around to the other side and hope that they cut the next road on the other side of this block of bush that they went into. We made the decision to go around to the other side 
and we were driving along this open floodplain in the direction of where these leopard tracks were headed. Uh, when we came across a termite mound along the side of the road, right next to the road, it was only a meter or so off the road, and on top of this open termite mound was a single dead impala, freshly killed, lying on top of this termite mound. And uh, we stopped to look at it. Uh, we got our binoculars out, had a close look at it through the binoculars, and we saw that it had a bite mark on the neck with a bit of blood dripping down out of the neck. So we, thought, we surmised, actually, that it was the leopard that had made the kill. So we were quite excited. The leopard must be around here. So we drove around. The leopard, other than the bite, the, the impala, other than the bite mark, was completely untouched. Uh, we drove around looking for the leopard, thinking it must just be resting nearby under a bush. And we drove around, drove around, could not find the leopard. Eventually, we went back to the carcass and we got out of the vehicle and we had a close look. And there we could see the fresh track of a female leopard right next to the, the impala carcass. Um, but no other marks or anything at all on, on the carcass. We then lifted up the carcass, we felt the carcass, and it was ice cold. Now, by this time, it was about eight o'clock in the morning, and this carcass was ice cold. It had not been freshly killed. It must have been killed maybe in the early hours of the morning, like one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, and now it was becoming a big mystery to us. Why would a leopard just leave a kill like this? Leopards do not do that kind of thing. They, they, when a leopard kills something, the first thing it does, in fact, if the kill is in the open, is it will drag it under a bush, it will drag it into cover. If it doesn't hoist it into a tree, it will at least drag it into cover to protect it uh, from being uh, scavenged. This leopard had not done that. It could not have been chased away by another predator because the carcass would have been taken away. Uh, so it was a real mystery. Why had this leopard made this kill and then just disappeared? We then thought, well, let's go down to the nearby uh, lagoon. Maybe the leopard had gone down there for a drink. When we got down to the lagoon, there was this big crocodile that slowly slid into the water. And we thought, okay, so maybe the leopard went down to drink and the crocodile took the leopard. So we looked carefully along the shoreline, but we found no sign of any leopard tracks. Uh, we then went out to a spot on this open floodplain where we could see right across the floodplain towards the termite mound where we could clearly see the impala sitting on top of the termite mound. And uh, we had a, our morning coffee and just sat and waited and watched carefully to see whether the leopard would come back to the, to the carcass. But it never came back. And around about 11 o'clock or so, we eventually left the area. In the, while we were having coffee, by the way, there were a couple of vultures that circled over this impala that was right out in the open. So we, we took a bet that when we went away, we would come back in the afternoon to find a whole bunch of fat vultures and the carcass cleaned up. So we went back to camp, had some lunch, and we came back out in the afternoon, drove carefully along the road, looking carefully for any sign of the leopard tracks. And uh, we approached the termite mound and on top of the termite mound, we found nothing. There was absolutely nothing there. There wasn't an impala, there wasn't a bit of fur, there was nothing. It was just completely empty. So we assumed, well, maybe the leopard had come back to take this kill. And we began to search around all over the place. We had carefully uh, uh, looked on the, on the track alongside the termite mound. There were, didn't seem to be any leopard tracks crossing the road. So we assumed that it was on the one side of the, the road. But we found nothing in that area. And eventually we got out of the vehicle and we walked very carefully along the vehicle track. It was a track with this lovely Afrikaans term called the middle maniki. Uh, and in the middle of this middle maniki, we came across the slight little drag mark. And then we realized a leopard or something had come and taken the carcass and dragged it across the road. So it was actually on the other side of the road. So we carefully followed through the grasses and eventually we uh, had gone about 200 meters and there we came across this leopard sitting there looking at us. And we were elated. We had finally found our leopard after an, almost an entire day looking for this leopard. 
Uh, and eventually she got up and she went into the undergrowth and she began to feed on the carcass. And uh, she had already had a good feed, you could see, and in, in this photograph you can see something that's typical of leopard behavior. They tend to pluck the fur off the carcass before they cut into the skin and, and break the carcass open. Anyhow, she had a good feed on the carcass and we decided to just spend the afternoon watching her and seeing what she got up to. Um, we were excited about the sighting, but our mystery had still not been solved. Why had this leopard left this carcass alone for so long? It was many hours that she had left the carcass. Eventually, the leopard got up and started walking after grooming herself. And when a leopard walks through the bush, leopards walk with their tails down. They don't walk with their tails up like this one does. What they normally do, when you see a leopard walking with its tail up, it's because some animals around her are giving alarm calls. They're agitated by her presence, and it could be squirrels or mongoose or impala kudu, even little birds like cysticulars and things could be giving their alarm calls. And the moment the, the leopard hears those alarm calls, she raises her tail in the air. But this leopard was not being alarmed by anything. There were, there, there were no animals that were alarming at this leopard. She was just walking along with her tail in the air. So we followed her, followed her about maybe two or 300, uh, two, two or 300 meters, and she disappeared into a thicket. We lost track of her. We went around to the other side of the thicket, and there we found the leopard lying inside the thicket. And if you look carefully, between her front legs, are the tiny little spot patterns of a newborn leopard cub that she was licking. Behind her, you could see a large dead fallen tree. And after a few minutes, she got up and she uh, climbed over into the fallen tree and she came out of the fallen tree with a second leopard cub in her mouth, which she then deposited next to the first one. Their eyes were tightly closed. The ears were still flat. They even looked still a little bit damp. And then we realized what must have happened. That leopard must have been pregnant. She was walking along, saw, saw this impala, pounced on it, and immediately after killing it, she came into labor and said, well, that's it. I better go off and go and give birth. And uh, that was one of the most amazing uh, experiences that I've ever had. I've had many experiences with leopards, lots of exciting experiences, but that to me was one, one of the most incredible. And uh, yeah, so we spent a few minutes just watching her grooming the, the two cubs and eventually left the area. And it was just absolutely incredible to have, particularly to have guests like I had who were prepared to sit and uh, and uh, help us to realize our sort of crime scene investigation skills. It was really wonderful. And we ended up having a wonderful celebratory drink that evening. So let's go back to citizen science. So what is citizen science? Um, citizen science is the collection and an analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public often in collaboration with scientists. And effectively, that's what this was. I, although I, I work as, or have worked as a professional safari guide, I'm no scientist really. I haven't been trained as a scientist, but I do have an interest in the natural world as many, many people all around the world have. And with a real interest and sense of curiosity and uh, with good observation skills, all of us have the ability to collect data to help us understand the natural world in a better way. And particularly if we can do this in collab collaboration with scientists, uh, we can really make a big contribution. So that's um, the definition of citizen science. Some examples of citizen science. So the first example that I can think of is this example that's uh, very popular in North America it's called the Christmas bird count. And the Christmas bird count is quite interesting because in the United States in the 1800s, every single Christmas, it was a tradition amongst Americans uh, that during Christmas, fam at family get-togethers, 
people would get uh, split up into little groups and they would head off into the wilderness around their homesteads and hunt birds. And the whole aim of these little hunting expeditions was to try and kill as many birds as you possibly could. And you come back in the evening and you win a little prize for killing the most birds. Uh, it didn't matter how big the birds were or how beautiful they were or rare or whether they were useful or not. That was simply what they did. It was a tradition in North America for most of the late 1800s. Then in December 1900, an ornithologist by the name of Frank Chapman suggested that, you know, instead of killing birds, why don't we just go out and count them? Let's have a competition and see who can count the most birds. And he managed to convince 27 volunteers in December 1900 to go out and count birds. And they went off in different directions. And that year they counted 18,500 birds of 90 different species. And that was the first example of citizen science. Since then, the Christmas bird count has grown to more than 75,000 volunteers, mostly in North America. And they are counting about 60 million birds every year from 2,500 species. And this data is collected from these counts and is used by scientists to calculate the winter ranges of birds and also to monitor uh, how bird numbers change over time. So it's an incredible contribution on the part of ordinary people just interested in birds who are making a big contribution. And so, for example, one of the contributions that has been made, and uh, to show you the shooting that went on, those are the volunteers. One of the contributions that has been made, there was a paper published just recently using a combination of the Christmas bird count and other data that indicates that nearly 3 billion birds have disappeared from North, the North American continent since 1970. The first time that citizen, the word citizen science was used was in 1989, when volunteers across the United States collected rainwater samples for the Audubon Society Acid Rain Project. So that was another example of a citizen, one of the early citizen science projects. And then in South Africa, we have many citizen science projects that have been very successful. One of the first ones was in 2008, when scientists from the Endangered Wildlife Trust designed this wonderful photographic competition in the Kruger National Park, where they offered wonderful prizes to people who uh, contributed the greatest number of photographs of African wild dogs. And uh, the way it works with African wild dogs is very much like the leopards. Every single African wild dog has a unique coat pattern. So if you look at this dog photograph in Botswana, these are two dogs photographed in a different part of Botswana. You can see every single coat pattern is different and unique. And so the they were able to build up a database of all the wild dogs and get a very accurate idea of how many wild dogs there were in the Kruger National Park. Uh, just from the photographs that, that were submitted by ordinary people, ordinary visitors to the Kruger National Park. And it's been very successfully run. It's been done over a few years. I'm not sure when the next project will be. Hopefully there will be one soon uh, in order to continue to monitor the numbers of dogs and see how they change over time. Uh, another great example is the, the Western Cape Leopard Toad Project. And once again, leopard toads have unique spot patterns on their backs. So it's possible to identify every single leopard toad just from a photograph. So there are ordinary people, volunteers, who wander around the Western Cape, around the Cape Town area, taking photographs of leopard toads, submitting them, and it gives scientists the uh, information about the movement of individual leopard toads and how their numbers are doing. It's a highly endangered species, and the more information we can have about leopard toads, the more we can do something about their conservation. And the wonderful thing today is the technology that we can use. And probably the largest citizen science project in the world is 
um, a citizen science project called iNaturalist. Um, and this works by means of your cell phones. You upload the iNaturalist app onto your cell phone. It gives you uh, a, a little means to take photographs of the things that you see. And, uh, and together with Google Maps, it records your coordinates immediately the moment you submit your photograph. And that data is then submitted to the scientists who are involved in the project. Uh, and citizen science, uh, the iNaturalist project has uh, accumulated more than 30 million observations since it began. And there are over 800,000 observers making contributions uh, to the iNaturalist projects. Uh, uh, iNaturalist can be used to, to identify pretty much anything that you find out there in the natural world. So each one of us can go out and just with our cell phones, if you find something that you don't know about, or if you want to record, start recording, particular animals in the area that you that you live and want to start building up a database, you can just simply take photographs and upload it onto the iNaturalist app. And you, uh, this incredible amount of data is being built up all over the world. And many of these records can be submitted to particular projects that are registered with iNaturalist. For example, there's AfriBats, where I've submitted a few bat photographs that I've taken. There's Afri Herps, which works on, on reptiles, and there's also the Flora of Africa projects. Uh, and all you need is your cell phone and the iNaturalist app. Amazing uh, program. Uh, and then one of the most successful in South Africa, and maybe in fact in the world, is the South African Bird Atlas project. Uh, this was originally started in 1987 and ran up until 1991. Uh, which and eventually resulted in the publication of that two volume set of books that totaled 1,500 pages and 7.3 million records. And this serves as a fantastic baseline for future projects. Uh, it was originally done manually, but today it is done in combination with another amazing app uh, that allows you to very quickly and easily record every single bird sighting that you make. Uh, Bird Lass is abs uh, an absolutely amazing application that is a great example of the kind of app that we need for all kinds of other living things. Uh, and then the Animal Demographic Unit, which actually started the, the Bird Atlas pro project, uh, has many other um, uh, 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 citizen science projects, including working on frogs, uh, dung beetle map, fish map, frog map, orchid map, and uh, there's also a mammal map. Uh, the uh, demographic, animal demographic unit has run into some financial problems. So a lot of these particular apps are now being moved onto the iNaturalist platform right now, making uh, um, iNaturalist even more important. Um, and this uh, kind of thing was highlighted to me with this particular little project. Uh, or, or little uh, correspondence that I had fairly recently where somebody submitted a photograph um, of a large gray mongoose track that they picked up in a place called the Mashatu Game Reserve in the Tuli block in, in uh, Botswana. Uh, and they were querying me because, or, or uh, asking around, trying to find out some information is, did anybody know if there were indeed large gray mongoose there because they had picked up the track of the large gray mongoose but if you have a look at the distribution map of the large gray mongoose in all of the reference works, there's no record of large gray mongoose in the Mashatu Game Reserve, which is where that red dot is. Um, so that's an example of a, a wonderful citizen science project. Those were just trackers. They were actually specifically people who were learning how to track, and they picked up this large gray mongoose track and look at that, it's right in the middle of no man's land between the distribution, existing distribution records. So somewhere out there, there must be some connection. There must be a lot more large gray mongoose around. But there was no real avenue at that time for them to submit that record for it to be recognized. And citizen science projects uh, designed along the likes of Bert Lasser um, will really help to, to expand our knowledge of, of mammals. Uh, from these uh, citizen scientists working around the world. So 
just to end off, in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve now, all the uh, safari guides, uh, the landowners, um, the, the people, the staff working in the reserve, most of them who are not trained scientists at all, are continuing to keep records of every single leopard sighting throughout the Sabi Sand. It all originated in the middle of the Sabi Sand in this particular area over here where I started to see the leopards for the first time. But now it has expanded over the whole of the Sabi Sand. Uh, this is all the records of the male leopards seen in the Sabi Sand over a one year period. And uh, this is all the records of the female leopards seen uh, in the Sabi Sand over the same one year period. And this data is now being submitted to scientists working at Panthera, the big, uh, big cat organization, and being collated. And the result of all these sightings is that uh, Panthera have produced, uh, the last I heard, about 12 scientific papers on these leopard observations that ordinary people are making in the Sabi Sand. So the wonderful thing about the citizen science stuff is that it allows every single one of us, just ordinary people, to make some kind of contribution to our knowledge uh, of the natural world. And all we need to do that is to be observant and to have curiosity. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lex. If you can just exit your screen, um, please. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we're going to give Lex a round of applause, I want to motivate this round of applause. So, Lex, every night we follow the numbers and we start seeing the trends when people start exiting their screens. <laughs> and very often around 10 to people start exit exiting. <laughs> there are 70 people who listen to you. A number of people couldn't come in for whatever reason. And all 70 people are still linked. And it's nearly 8 o'clock. So that says that you really, really did something significant. What you taught us tonight was really wonderful. And everybody was glued to their screens. So I'm going to unmute everybody. And then we give Lex a wonderful round of applause. Thank you, Lex. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we, uh, I just want to ensure that you unmute Lex. And Rod, are you an unmute Rod? I'm unmuted. And great. Um, then, ladies and gentlemen, if you know how to raise the electronic hand, do so. If not, just put up your hand and uh, then we would take your questions. Time for questions and answers. Any I questions? See, I see Ian Cockrell's got his hand up. All right, Ian Cockrell, I know exactly. Uh, look, he looks, I must, yeah, got him, unmute him. There we go, Mr. Cockrell. Wait, wait, wait. You're not, you must accept yeah. unmute. There you are. Yeah. Good. Lex, thank you very much indeed. That was a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. One question, um, you showed how the, the, the cubs, the female cubs sort of move away from, um, from the mother, but still stay in close proximity. And you kind of indicated a degree of overlap of their areas of influence. As they get fully matured, is there any further interaction between mother and cubs or are they all fiercely independent? Thank there you. is no, some interaction. Uh, yes, there is some interaction that goes on. So, uh, in in general, they avoid one another, and we do quite often observe this uh, thing that or phenomenon that we call parallel walking, where the two leopards of neighbouring territories walk alongside one another, uh, very often drooling at the at the mouth, uh, but not getting uh, specifically very aggressive towards one another. But there is definitely pressure being asserted by those young, young females on the mother's territory. So they, they're putting pressure on each other as those uh, territories, um, 
as, as more female leopards produce more cubs, more female cubs, that's, that's what is happening. So you've got to remember that, um, particularly in an area like the Sabi Sand, which is pretty much saturated with all the leopard, potential leopard territories are taken up by leopards. There's no, um, there's very little vacuum. There's no empty space. So you've got to remember that every neighboring female that produces a female cub is putting uh, pressure on the next neighboring female by uh, raising that particular cub. Uh, and, and so I think that that pressure leads to probably increased mortality uh, in order to bring the levels down to the natural levels that are sustainable. So there is some pressure being asserted. And then there are some cases, so, um, uh, where, where there's some fairly unusual sightings where, which I haven't really observed that much personally, but you do get records of female leopards um, feeding on a carcass together with uh, uh, cubs from previous generations. Uh, that does sometimes happen, and that seems to be fairly amicable. Thank you know. very much, Lex. Um, I just want to say that the, the hand of Daniela is up. Rod, if you can find an unmuter. And then I just want to mention, that, uh, uh, Lex, that Dion Kruger struggled to come in, uh, but eventually he's in. So just for you to know, uh, Daniela... Um, if you are unmuted, please ask your question. Hi. Hi, Lex. Hi, um, Lex. Here Hi, with Daniela. Adi. How are you? Yeah, well, thank you. Good, <laughs> great good. chat. Thank you. Um, great, great to see your name there. I don't see you, but I see your name. Wait. Uh, hold on. Let's fix that. There we go. Yes, Hi. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask, um, just because uh, I also got, uh, well, had the privilege of working in the sands for a good number of years uh, and drove many of the roads that you got to drive, um, but I was just curious, with the high predator density and the time that you spent observing leopards in the sands, and I'm sure it's not very high, but what was the success of a female leopard raising three, all three cubs to adulthood? Was that ever the case? Or, yeah, how often did you ever see it, if you were lucky enough to? Yeah. So uh, you saw that photograph, I think the second or third photograph that I showed you of a leopard that was a female leopard with three cubs. Uh, we, that one, unfortunately, she ended up only raising one cub. And I don't recall through my period of time, and I, I don't really know enough about the latest sightings, but I don't recall any leopard successful, successfully raising all three cubs. Certainly yeah. two cubs, but I haven't heard of all three. Uh, during my time there, we found that about 50% of the cubs died before they reached independence. Uh, yeah. But the long-term study that, that's been done, one of the papers that was produced based on the studies all the way back from our time in 79, right, right up until recently, shows that only about 37% of cubs reach independence. So is very, there is quite high mortality rate in those cubs. Thank you. There's a question from Mariska now and from Dale. So let's get Mariska. You are a Mariska, you are unmuted. unmuted Chris. Yes. Hi, Mariska. You can't, uh, you need to unmute Mariska. Hi, hi Lex, hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, we just want to know, basically, you've taken our photographs of various leopards and how have you established aging these leopards? Like, I know the common thing is maybe the dewlap, but we've experienced that most people don't really agree. They found that the dewlap is not an accurate um, indication. What, what out of your experience would you say? Yeah, so Mariska, I, to be honest with you, I can't say for sure that I know 100% how to age a leopard. I know that quite a lot of people talk about the pink nose, that the pinker the nose is, the younger it is. I personally haven't studied it well enough to be sure, do, is that strictly correct or not? Uh, what I tend to look for is scars, scar, uh, you know, particularly wear and tear around the ears. 
uh, and that usually tells me whether a leopard is old or not. Uh, so, so basically, I think the more scarring a leopard has, the older it is. Uh, and, and the dewlap, I think, really mostly applies to big males, and, and we start seeing more of a, a big dewlap on big older males. But uh, to be honest with you, I find it quite hard to be sure that I know how to accurately age a leopard. Thanks, Lex. I just want to ask Gus, if you want to make any comment, just put up your hand. No, Gus, he is Gus. keeping quiet. <laughs> quiet. He's keeping okay, quiet. Dale, Dale, I'm unmuting you. Dale, your question. Accept the unmute. You got to unmute. Yeah. Oh, yes. There you go, Hello? Dale. Yeah. <laughs> you unmuted? Yes. yes. Um, I would like to ask a question about um, the uh, citizen science side of things. Um, how do you ascertain when someone is uh, contributing real information towards citizen science or someone who is maybe not contributing information that is useful to science? Right. Because there could be, yeah, there could be quite a few differences in that regard. Um, yeah. Okay. No, I, I think that's that's a good question, and and it's uh, it's it's obviously that can be ch a challenge. So, Bird Lasser has a great system. Uh, what you do is you submit all your bird sightings and uh, they analyze it. They have particular people in control of the na analysis of the bird sightings of a particular region of Southern Africa. And, um, and they go through those sightings very carefully. I think there's probably an, some kind of an algorithm that helps them identify what one might call dodgy or unusual sightings. And that then gets highlighted and immediately gets sent back to the observer who then has to answer a number of detailed questions about the observation that they have made. So, so that's how Bird Lasser deals with that. And, um, and I think it's probably quite a good way of doing it. I, you know, maybe there's one or, or two dodgy things that come through. Uh, we're not really sure. Uh, what was very interesting was that in, um, uh, in the iNaturalist, one of the iNaturalist workshops that I attended, uh, we had a discussion about this, and I naturally seems to work on a democratic system, <laughs> which is quite an interesting system. So if you submit a sighting that you don't know, you wait for somebody to identify it. And the more people that agree with that identification, the more likely that identification is accepted. But it becomes a little bit like a democracy. Uh, is democracy always right? Is it is uh, because the majority believe it's right, or is it not right? So, so that that I think is maybe one of the challenges with with iNaturalist. Uh, but you do have scientists involved with with most of the uh, citizen science projects who will look out for anything that might be dodgy and question it very intensely and very carefully. I think that's probably the only way that one can do it. I don't know if Rod might have some contribution there regarding Bert Lasser or, or uh, anybody else has a contribution to make there. But I think that's the way you have to. You yeah, have to I, can, I, can, I can come in a bit, Lex, on, on the birding because I was involved in the first Bird Atlas project in a big way. It, uh, all, the, all the records were submitted to a committee who had to, to vote on them. And, and uh, with birds, it was easy because because there's a lot of known data so if you if you submit a a wandering albatross from kruger park it's <laughs> going to come up it's going to throw throw out an anomaly yes. and and you're easily going to find it so so computer programs can easily pick up that because we can easily pick up that uh, it becomes more complicated with with um, smaller mammals insects and, and things like that but yes it's it 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 um with birds, it's fairly easy because there is so much knowledge, and citizens have so much knowledge. Yeah. But when it comes to when it comes to mammals, we're getting more and more knowledge as well from citizens as well. 
but but with the smaller projects like uh, like the the odonata and the, the the dragonflies and and the the, the orchids you're going to have a lot more trouble like that um, yeah. you know, it's, it's 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 complicated but yeah you you, 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 you need a lot of trust yeah Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Lex. I'm going to allow for one. There's two more questions. But what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to thank Lex again and um, uh, for a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, Lex. Um, then I want to just remind you of Dave Fetler's talk coming Tuesday with a great thanks again to Lex and looking forward to uh, Dave's talk. Um, there's two questions here. Um, the one is by, Hel uh, well, I'm first going to Ella, I'm first going to give Sabil, Sabil Guzman a chance, then Ella. And then also, I just want to mention Jup Stevens, you're the guy who's got your hand in all those photos that you've taken over 50 years in Kruger Park. And I see Aisha Mabara is in tonight, which is fantastic. Young PhD, who just finished her PhD and started joining the LCA. Fantastic. Okay. So, Sabil Guzman, we will unmute you. And there you go, you're unmuted. Thanks, okay, Sabil. can you hear me? Yes, you can yes, we can. Okay. Hi, Lex. Um, thanks for a fantastic talk. Um, it absolutely resonated with me because I've been going to Timbavati for a number of years for wildlife photography. And the same way what you described in Savi has been happening in Timbavati. Um, individual leopards uh, have been habituated to vehicles, etc. And you get the whole history of those leopards. You see them over the years, their offspring, etc., which is fantastic. Um, one question I have is, that is something I, I could not quite figure out. Um, you're allowed to follow with the game vehicles these leopards and they go out for a hunt and you are in a way disturbing them um, they don't care about the vehicle but um, you might actually disturb them while they go on a hunt and you actually you know the 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 animal that the leopard is is wants to stalk sees the vehicle first and it runs away that kind of impact is something that I can't quite fathom um, if it is a negative impact on, on leopards. Okay, yes. So there's no doubt in my mind that that is the case. I think that the moment you try and follow a leopard that is hunting, uh, it is a big, big challenge. No matter how sensitively you are trying to drive, it is a big challenge to avoid uh, interfering with that hunt in one way or another. And, and there, there can be many different ways that that can happen. I mean, it could be that you flush an animal out from under the, ve the, the wheels of the vehicle into the leopard's path. So that could skew the data, if you like. Um, uh, the noise that the vehicle makes as you go going through the bush, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that could be interfering with the leopard's hearing because the, the leopard depends a lot on its hearing to detect prey ahead of it. Uh, sometimes it's an advantage for the leopard to, to have a vehicle going through the bush like that. Um, so I would say that in general, it is an interfering factor and that uh, you, uh, if you want to try and follow leopard hunting, it, it's not that easy to actually witness the whole hunt uh, from beginning to end because of the way the vehicle moves around and and the noise that the vehicle makes. So, uh, yeah, I don't have any doubt in my mind that that is the case. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the question comes in is to what extent does one allow that to happen? You know, what, should it just be avoided altogether or do you try and allow some viewing of that to a limited extent and then leave the leopard to itself? Uh, you know, that becomes the big debate. But there's no doubt that I, I think that it does interfere with the, the hunting behavior. Thank you, Alex. I'm keeping my eye on Gus. If you have anything to say, Gus, raise your hand. But now I'm going to Hella. 
Hello, please, I'm unmuting you. Your question, please, except unmute, Hella. Yes, Thank unmuted. You. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, hello, hello. Yes, thank you, Les, for this very insightful talk about the life of leopards. Now, I have a question. I, uh, uh, I attended a talk by the Cape Leopard Trust, and this now was a bit of a curiosity on the sense of smell of leopards. And they were uh, putting up night cameras, and they found that the Cape Leopards they had on, um, uh, on, on, on the picture, in, on the film, it was particularly interested in scents. So they put different scents of perfume all around. And the leopards just adored that. And they went quite wild about those perfumes. So that at the end of the talk, they asked the public, the citizen science, you know, to donate flacons of perfume if they didn't need, the, uh, if, if we wouldn't need them. So have you heard anything about that? Mm -hmm. Um, Helen, no, I've not heard anything about that. I mean, we know how leopards, re uh, not leopards, cats react to this catnip. I think it's the smell that they react to from what I understand. But I've not seen anything like that personally or been sure of seeing anything like that in the wild with leopards in the wild. Um, you know, I suppose if, if cats react to catnip, then maybe uh, leopards react to some plants out there. Uh, and I certainly haven't experimented with perfumes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're now getting to a free for all. Um, again, so we're reaching the informal phase where anybody can just raise their hand, ask their Donella. question. Donella. Uh, no, I see Donella's hand is up. I just want to say that if you want to raise a question, what we yeah, I wanted to um, unmute all of you, but we'll rather check the hands because it can become very noisy with everybody unmuted. So, Rod, if you can, there's uh, Matthew also. Let's do Daniela. She raised her hand, and then Matthew. Okay, Daniela, I'm unmuting you. Dan. Um, yes. So um, it's it's not a question, more more of a statement. Just because I really enjoyed um, the topic of citizen science, um, is that I don't, I often think that people don't realize that the power that you could potentially have in contributing to the scientific community and. An example is um, over the years, AD has gotten me into um, orchiding, if you could call it that. So uh, going out um, and looking for different types of orchids, and it's it's you know it's kind of like birding but a different level, and it's it's quite addictive. And we were um, uh, in hogs back in January. And uh, we went on a drive with uh, Krista, who's also online, and uh, we went for a drive and we found, you know, according to the book, a very rare orchid, um, you know, and we were really excited about it. And um, I'm part of the, uh, it's a group on Facebook, uh, Flowers of Southern Africa, and I posted a picture of the orchid and um, I actually got a, a response back from a scientist from Rhodes University who just before lockdown was preparing to send a team to Hogsback in search of this orchid colony, which we ended up finding for them in the end. So we sent them the details of exactly where we found this orchid and we saved them a lot of time and resources from something that we didn't actually realize what was as big of a deal as it was to somebody else? Just having that yeah. interest in looking for a new orchid. So I just yeah. wanted to, um, yeah, say that's, that's why I really enjoyed yeah, this topic of citizen science. No, that's yeah. a fantastic, fantastic example. And, and every one of us has that ability. And, you know, we're exploring our little patches everywhere, our favorite little patches that scientists haven't necessarily visited intensively at all. So. Uh, we, we need to just keep our eyes open and we can be making new discoveries and, uh, and making big, big contributions for sure, for sure. Yeah. So that's a great example, Daniela. Thank you for that. Thank, yeah. thank you very much, Lex and Daniela. Matthew, you can, I'm going to unmute you, but anybody who's going to talk now can unmute themselves.
Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, a comment and a question. Um, on the leopard age estimation side of things, I think scarring is a very good thing. But what, in my experience, I find the most um, good, the best indicator of age is tooth coloration. So as the leopard ages, the tooth actually gets yellower and yellower and eventually will turn kind of an, an orangey color. color. And then the question is, do you have any information in Sabu Sands on the dispersal distance of male leopards from their natal kind of um, female territory range? And do you know how they orientate themselves in their landscape in relation to distance? Like, uh, can a leopard see a feature that it might recognize in its territory 60, 70, 80 kilometers away, 30 kilometers away? Any indication of that kind of information? Sure. Well, I think the, the last question is a hard one for me to answer. I, I really am not sure how, wh what these animals see in the environment. I, I think it's, there's probably a whole combination of factors that gets them to orientate themselves. It must be a combination of all of their senses, not just what they see, but what they smell. Um, uh, but, uh, but it's a very hard one to answer that. I, I don't know how far they can see and, and uh, it, there must be landmarks. I mean, you know, I, I had a, a, a leopard, an example that I have, and, and there's a certain memory that the leopards have, uh, where a leopard killed a, a warthog, stashed it away under a bush, went off to go and fetch her cubs. On her way to fetching the cubs, about a kilometer away, she killed a daker, hoisted the daker in the tree, uh, went to fetch the, the, the cubs, fed on the daker for two days, and then when she finished, she went to the warthog. She remembered that the warthog was still under this bush. And luckily, it was still there, and she managed to go and feed on that. And that was in the middle of the bush. It wasn't as though it was on a road near some uh, distinctive landmark. So how did she remember that particular spot? How did she know it was there? There's no doubt scent must play a big, important role with that. But I don't really know. I can't answer that. I don't know the answer to that. And then your other question was um, um, dispersal distance. Oh yeah, yeah, dispersal. So, so one of the very first male cubs that we had uh, dispersed from um, from uh, the natal area uh, moved about a distance of about thirty kilometers. He eventually established himself as a territorial male about 30 kilometers away. Uh, there was another leopard that dispersed into the Kruger National Park, became a territorial male there, and that was uh, in the region of 35, 40 kilometers away. Um, some of the more recent ones, I can't recall now uh, the actual distances, but uh, I think there's some, uh, th those are definite examples that I can remember. Thank you, Lex. Um, I don't see other hands at the moment. No electronic hands raised. That indicates to me that we are very close to the end of the show. Just two things. To read, are you on? To read. Can you unmute yourself if you are on the read the swat? Not seeing you at the moment. Um, okay. Uh, two things. Just want to mention. Uh, because this also seems to me a very particular group of people who are very interested in probably predators or leopards, cheetahs, whatever. Um, I just want to mention that Gus Moles is doing a talk on the 16th of June. Gus, and your talk is going to be, if I'm not mistaken, on wild dog in Kruger. Am I right? I've unmuted you, Gus. Uh, Chris, yes, thank you. Um, I hope uh, Lex will be at that talk because, um, in fact, we started doing surveys of the wild dogs with citizen science in uh, 20 years before 2008, Lex. Okay. We did our first photographic survey in 19, uh, 1989, if I remember rightly. Wow. Um, and then we did several. It was sponsored by the EWT. Uh, but yeah, so um, yeah, so I'll be talking about what we found out the wild dogs, and that's, this is going back to those days. So it's 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 a long, quite a long time ago. But we we did uh, find some interesting stuff 
uh, that I would like to discuss with you. All right, Gazi. Um, I see that Yup Stevens, um, uh, Yup, I'm unmuting you. Yup has got a question. You're unmuted, Yup. You can ask your question. And good evening, Yup. Good to see you again. Yup used you, to be Chris. my boss many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good colleague. Thank you, Lex, for a great uh, talk. Um, yeah, hi there, Lex. I haven't been involved in Kruger for a number of years. We had uh, quite a few incidents about a dozen and a half that I'm aware of, of human, fatal human and leopard incidents in the park. Um, yet, yet we have a much bigger predator, the lion, around and there's hardly incidents that are recorded about that. Um, I always find it interesting that uh, the leopard, of which there are a lot less in Kruger, are involved in a lot more human fatalities, showing that it's basically a most, much more effective predator. Um, your, your perspective on, on that aspect? Thank you. Um, yep, I, I don't know that I can really comment on that. I mean, I, I have heard about a number of those leopard uh, incidents and invariably the, the information that seems to come out of it indicates that these leopards are either sick so, uh, or, or old or there's something wrong with the individual leopards. Uh, mostly that's what I've, I've, I've seen to hear about it. Um, but I don't really, I can't really comment, to be honest. You know, I th I th I'm just trying to think of the examples. I think there was somebody who was uh, taken out by a leopard in Skakuza, uh, Star Village. They identified that leopard as having um, uh, bovine TB. I think there was another leopard, S similar kinds of things. It, there seems, there often seem to be that kind of issue with the leopards. Uh, and maybe that's the reason that these leopards are resorting to taking out human beings. Um, but I don't really know, to be honest. 